Hello and welcome back to Franklin Covey's On Leadership with Scott Miller podcast series. That's me. I'm your weekly host and interviewer now in our fourth year of broadcasting weekly with new interviews from thought leaders, best-selling authors, business titans, celebrities, generals, and otherwise people that have dedicated their lives, their research, their educations to a topic that we find compelling and that you might find interesting in your own leadership journey. I'm also the author of the best-selling book, Master Mentors, 30 Transformative Insights from Your Greatest Minds, where in the first year or two, I picked 30 of what were perhaps my favorite podcast interviews, where a guest had a transformational insight, and the book is available on all major book retailing platforms, as well as Master Mentors Volume 2, coming out October 4th, available now for pre-order, where I've interviewed and highlighted 30 new mentors, 30 new insights. In fact, today's guest was so compelling in his first experience here, I included him as master mentor number 30 in the first volume. His name is Eric Barker. He's the author of the national bestseller, the Wall Street Journal bestselling book, Barking Up the Wrong Tree. And today he is back to talk about his newest release, Plays Well with Others, The Surprising Science Behind Why Everything You Know About Relationships is Mostly Wrong. Eric Barker, welcome back to your second time on Leadership. It's great to be here. Thanks. Great to have you, Eric. It, 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 it is important, I think, that I share our first interview I thought was uh, remarkably compelling. The insights you shared from your first book, Barking Up the Wrong Tree, in fact, I thought were so relevant, I chose to make you the capstone, the end mentor in the first book. The book has done extremely well. I keen on, on it frequently, frequently each week. The insight that I shared from you, as you know, and gave me permission was the compelling need to understand and know your story in life. What is your journey? In fact, because of my interview with you, I went on and gave dozens of keynotes where I shared the insight from the power of knowing your story. Would you rewind for a few minutes and perhaps reorient our guests and our listeners and viewers to your journey? What is it you do? Talk about your blog, your first book, and we'll dive into Plays Well with Others. Yeah, I've been blogging on about social science research and self-improvement for about 13 years now. And uh, my first book, Barking Up the Wrong Tree, was looking at the maxims of success we all grew up with. Nice guys finish last. It's not what you know, it's who you know. And basically stress testing them, myth busters, looking at the research. Are these things true or not? And Freud basically said the two key parts of life are work and relationships. So my first book was Success and Work. My second book, I followed it up with Relationships, and I used the same format. Those maxims we all grew up with around relationships, you know, is a friend in need a friend indeed? Does love conquer all? You know, can you read a book by its cover? And so I went down the rabbit hole in the research and explored to find out whether those true are true or not. Eric, talk for a minute about your blog. You have a remarkably um, highly subscribed to blog called by the same name, Barking Up the Wrong Tree. Talk about its content and how someone can subscribe to it. Yeah, basically, uh, it's if people go to ericbarker.org, ericbarker.org. Yeah, I've been doing the blog for 13 years now, and I try to take the research so we can get hard answers, but I try to make it accessible, fun, relatable, and... Basically, each time I'm kind of looking at a different arena of social science and psychology and lending it to actionable things we can use to try and be better at work and at home. It's a great blog. I enjoyed it as well. Eric, let's dive into your current book, All About Relationships. It's a topic that Franklin Covey is very passionate about. In fact, our chief people officer, Todd Davis, also one of the 31st master mentors, wrote several books. And he's pretty passionate about the fact that in organizations, people are not your most valuable asset. It's kind of human resource bunk. It's not true. People are not an organization's most valuable asset. But rather, it's the relationships between those people that is every company's ultimate competitive advantage, how you complement each other, how you work well together, how you forgive, how you pre-forgive, how you make judgments or recognize your judgments even could be wrong about people. I'm passionate about the topic as well. You talked about Freud being a bit of the inspiration behind the focus on relationships. Before we jump in to the idea of first impressions, what are some of the big takeaways that you learned from perhaps debunking some of the common adages or myths around relationships? 
Well, kind of like what you were just saying regarding it's not the people, it's the relationships between the people. It's really interesting. Uh, 2020 study showed that like having five friends is great, but if those five friends know each other, it is so much more valuable in terms of community, in terms of feeling supported, in terms of being happy, because when friends know each other, they can coordinate, they can work together, they can do things as a group to try and help you. So those, those connections really are key. And the, when the network becomes strengthened, the end result becomes strengthened. So it really is true that it is those, that, that full network of relationships as opposed to just a hub and spoke between you and another person. It was, that, that's a very insightful statement. But beyond that, I found a number of things that really shocked me. One of the key w issues was the issue of loneliness. And it turns out loneliness isn't about not feeling, not being around others. Loneliness is how we feel about our relationships. This is why we can feel lonely in a crowd. This is why we don't necessarily feel warm and supported on a subway or on a bus, because it's not necessarily proximity to other people. It's your perception of how, how strong and meaningful your relationships are. Eric, let's talk about first impressions. You actually write in the book a whole chapter dedicated to the power of first impressions, and you actually write that first impressions are, in fact, generally accurate. But once they're set, they're extremely hard to change. Would you riff on that and build in all of us some self-awareness around how we tend to form first impressions and why and when they're accurate and perhaps when to be a little more thoughtful around giving someone perhaps maybe a second chance? Yeah, this is really critical. It's, it's, it's fascinating because in, when we're talking with someone, our ability to read their thoughts and feelings, we're actually quite poor at this. Yet, when we're sizing somebody up holistically the first time we meet them, we're generally about 70% accurate, which is, which is pretty good. You know, the, the issue here is that double-edged sword. Yeah, it's like you're 70% accurate when sizing somebody up. However, once we make those judgments, they tend to lock in. And that's where we need to be really careful. Like you said, a really key part of this is giving somebody a second chance because otherwise, just statistically, you know, you're, if you judge somebody negatively and you decide to never deal with them again, they've got no chance for you to correct, for you to adjust for an error. And there's a 30% margin of error there roughly versus if we see somebody again and again, we can update, we can see whether they're having a bad day or whether a bad person was having a good day. But what's really critical is to be cognizant of the fact that our brains are immediately making judgments of people. And rather than just seizing on those, because that leads us to confirmation bias, or instead of really hypothesis testing like a scientist, we get a theory and we just assume it's true, and then our brains try and back it up. We need to realize when we're first meeting somebody, our brain is making theories but we should probably test them. We should probably see, like, is this person really true? Is this really a good idea? We should hold those quick opinions, those quick judgments a little more lightly. You know, Eric, I think it's a profound insight because when I read that chapter in the book, I started thinking about people that perhaps in the organization that I don't care for, uh, for whatever reason. I think they've treated me bad or we have different political views, whatever it was, right? We all have uh, supporters and detractors inside of our organizations. Newsflash, people don't like you and you don't like some people. Not you, Eric, but you know <laughs> those listening. But as I read this chapter in the book, I started thinking about the names of the people that perhaps I have a more critical or harsh assessment of. And I asked myself, has that been reinforced multiple times by their behavior or perhaps by my confirmation bias? Or was it a one particularly bad occasion and I've never encountered them again? I'd never give them a second chance. They were a good person having a bad day. And I thought, you know what, I probably, for the people that I have a harsh judgment of on a first impression, I need to give them a second chance, as I would hope that they would give me. But then I harked back about 25 years ago when I worked for the Franklin Covey Company. I was actually in a kind of a satellite company. And there was a fairly harsh financial analyst. She was a female, her gender is immaterial, but she was pretty harsh and she treated our team quite harshly. We had bought their company, and then they, she was put as our financial analyst. Kind of awkward. And none of the salespeople cared for her. Quite frankly, I didn't either. And then this was in my 20s. One week, and I chose to go up to Seattle and like spend a week and kind of befriending her, because now I was the leader of the team, and we needed her on our side. It was very antagonistic. 
We went to coffee, we went to lunch, we went to botanical gardens, and I really became to like her. We had nothing in common, different socioeconomic backgrounds, different political views, but I came to better appreciate sort of what was driving her motives, what were her fears, what were her passions. And I tell you, after that weekend, her whole personality and brand changed. She became much more charitable to our group. I think it was partially because I got to know her better, but I also gave her a second chance. I just think it's a powerful, simple but powerful reminder that first impressions are generally accurate, but when they're harsh or negative or perhaps de minimis in our relationships, we might need to make a second round at it to see if we've got the full picture there. Absolutely. I mean, the 70% figure, you know, it's like, obviously, it's way higher than uh, flipping a coin, but 70% is still a D in school. You wouldn't want your key, a kid to come back with, with all 70% on their report card. So it's, it is something. And another key to kind of, you know, a corollary to that is since we tend, we all tend to lock on to our first impressions, it's critical to think about your own first impressions because other people are going to lock on to them to think about how do I want to present myself, not in terms of a deceptive or acting way, but to think about which facet of your personality, you know, which of the many yous inside you, the one you are with your friends, the one you are at business, the one you are in different areas of your life, which, which, which honest, sincere part of you should you put at the forefront because people are going to tend to lock on to that. And you, you wouldn't want to have to spend a lot of time trying to undo that, you know, as it was difficult in the, in the situation you described. Eric, let's pivot to liars. Not, a, not you and I, of course, but everybody else who lies a lot. <laughs> the you, other liars. The other liars, that's right. The real ones. You share some compelling statistics around how frequently we lie, who we lie to, who we don't lie to who we lied to with less frequency. Let's talk about that, and then we'll talk about some of the questions you can ask to get to the real truth with people. Yeah, it's, it's pretty crazy. Uh, basically, we, we, we lie most frequently to mom. Uh, we tell the biggest lies to our spouse, though we don't lie to them nearly as often. You know, and you do, it, lies are pretty frequent among college students, less so among adults, but you, you, still, you still hear probably about a 20 to 30 percent you know you do hear a rough uh, pretty sizable amount of of uh, of lies per day and you usually tell about two whoppers a day so you know lying's lying's pretty common lying something we all have to deal with and the tricky part is that most of the research on what we've we've uh we've learned about detecting lies you know it has no connection to what a lot of people believe a lot of people believe that liars won't look you in the eye that's not true. A study of incarcerated psychopaths found that when they're telling lies, they actually look people in the eye more often than, than regular people do. And the polygraph and a lot of other things that we believe about lies, those look for stress or anxiety as lie detection methods. And that is never shown to consi consistently be the case. A lot of people look for specific body language. Body language has never been shown to be correlated with, with lies. So it's a lot of what we believe is a bunch of myths, honestly. But I think you said in both this interview and the book that on average we tell two lies a day. I think you wrote that we're on the receiving end of about 200 lies a day. Yeah. And don't tell every day, right? So it made, me, it made me kind of stop in my tracks when I read this and thought, okay, so which two lies did I tell today? Were they to my mom? Were they to my spouse? You know, who, who were they to? Yeah. It's a remarkable um, insight. And then you actually share some questions that we can actually uh, draw upon to determine if someone is lying. One of them, I liked this idea around ask unanticipated questions. Kind of walk us through why we would want to get to the truth with someone, obviously. But what is the role that unanticipated questions has when it comes to dealing with people who are lying? Yeah, basically, uh, airport screeners... Uh, only successfully detect lies roughly 5% of the time. And they, but when they use unanticipated questions, that shoots up to almost 65%. And the issue here is that a liar can't prepare for every possible question you could ask them. But we usually ask pretty general, predictable questions. So if you were to ask questions that were unanticipated, 
you're going to get to the thing that does accurately tell lies, and that is what's called cognitive load. Basically, like I said, stress doesn't work, but cognitive load, that's the issue of telling lies actually requires a fair amount of brain power. You have yeah. to think hard. You have to think about the lie. You have to think about the truth. You have to make sure the other person's not catching on. So what you want to do is increase the amount of brain power it requires to make them think hard because that's going to make somebody slow down, have to double back, and their lies are going to be more detectable. How unanticipated questions works is, let's say you were a bartender and somebody comes into the bar who's clearly underage. Now, if you were to ask them, how old are you? They would probably just say 21. But what if you were to ask them, what year were you born? That's probably something they didn't think about. But it's a question that's very easy for someone telling the truth. But someone who's not telling the truth is probably going to have to do some math. They're going to slow down, and that's going to be pretty obvious. Asking someone these type of unanticipated questions is really powerful. If somebody says, oh, yeah, I was at that meeting, you can ask them, well, was Carol wearing that scarf she always wears? This is really dangerous for a liar because that's something you can verify. That's something you can check on. And these are the kind of questions that will reveal. They'll stumble over their words. They'll slow down. They'll make excuses. This is what has been shown to actually work in research studies. It was such a powerful chapter. It has weaponized me as a father against my three young sons to ask more <laughs> penetrating questions. But no, honestly, it also was sort of insightful to ask myself what two lies did I tell today? What two am I going to tell tomorrow? And to who and why? So it was, it was a little self-reflective. I, I want to pivot to another part of your book where you talk about Dale Carnegie, of course, the seminal yeah. author, similar to our founder, Dr. Stephen R. Covey. He wrote a very powerful book uh, back in 1936, I think, that was called How to Win Friends and Influence People. Most of us have heard of or at least read or are aware of this book. In fact, this company is still very much a robust uh, organization training millions of people a year. But you kind of go to work at debunking some of the things that Dale taught. In fact, the eighth principle that he taught was to try to see, to honestly see things from the other person's point of view, right? Empathy, we get this. And this is something that's very present in today's leadership um, uh, uh, guidance, if you will, especially you know during the pandemic. And recognizing that we may have all been in the same storm, but we weren't metaphorically all in the same ship. But you spent some time saying the following from, I think, one of your researchers. Never have we found any evidence that perspective taking, putting yourself in another person's shoes and imagining the world through his or her eyes, increase accuracy in these judgments. Not only is it not effective, it actually makes you worse at them. Talk a little bit about what I'm getting right or wrong there how important and how valuable is perspective taking and how do we improve upon it? Well, I mean, if you ask the other person their perspective and reflect that, accept that, acknowledge that, that's great. But the issue here is that if you are assuming the perspective of the other person, it's an assumption. You don't really know where they're coming from. So usually what happens is people make an assumption about the other person's perspective and start operating on that immediately. And generally our assumptions are wrong. Nicholas Epley at University of Chicago did research that shows when we try to, we try to read the thoughts and feelings of other people, of strangers, we're only accurate about 20% of the time. With friends, that goes up to 30%. And with spouses, that goes up to 35%. So whatever you think your spouse is thinking, two thirds of the time you're wrong. So when we start to make assumptions in terms of the other person's perspective, we're probably, we might be going further off base than we would have been by just keeping our mouths shut. So if you want to ask the other person their perspective, that's fantastic. But trying to assume that we know it, that's where people make a lot of errors. A lot of what was really interesting to me was Dale Carnegie's work was done long before the advent of social science research. And yet all of his key principles, except for that one, uh, have been validated. He was, he was pretty accurate, you know, even though most of his stuff was anecdotal. The only issue about Dale Carnegie's stuff is that he was very focused on, on business networking and not making deeper relationships. So Carnegie's stuff is very useful for networking, for business relationships, and for the beginning of personal relationships. But it's really not enough to get us to those kind of deep, lasting 
strong connections that we would want for a fulfilling personal life. Eric, I found that kind of stopped me in my tracks, not just as a fan of Dale Carnegie, but in my own yeah. relationship with my wife, Stephanie, is I think I do an extraordinarily great job at reading her mind, and you've proven me wrong. And in fact, as I thought about the science and the statistics, I realized how frequently she corrects me on what it is she's thinking and not thinking. And I probably weaponize that against her, as all spouses do if they were honest about you know, how they communicate and lie and manipulate and all that. And it was a, it was a good marriage, uh, uh, marital advice in your book, good relationship advice, obviously. You, I wanna go back to something you said in the beginning about connection. You talked about how important it is that if your five friends know each other, it's even better exponentially to your health yeah. and your relationships, your well-being, your state of mind, your emotional, mental health, the loneliness that sets in from you know, living life uh, sequestered or uh, sheltered at home. I still can't believe we use that term, shelter at home, during <laughs> the pandemic. I think back about it, it was scarring for many of us, like a war. Um, Talk about, talk about what you've learned around the power of connection. Perhaps for those who are listening and watching who may identify as an introvert. Perhaps they're fairly shy. Perhaps they don't have the social skills for whatever reason or they've had some trauma in their life and they're hesitant to build connections. Talk and reinforce the power that connections play in our relationships. Maybe the different ways we can make connections if we're fairly socially awkward or we have some anxiety or even some social you know, um, anxiety disorders. Riff on that, if you will. Yeah, I mean, certainly different people vary in their needs for social connection. But that said, you know, we need to feel like we have the support that we need. Otherwise, literally, neuroscientists have put people in an fMRI scanner. When people feel lonely, when people feel disconnected, their brains scan for threats twice as fast. It goes from 150 mil, I'm oh, sorry, from you know, 300 milliseconds to 150 milliseconds. So their brains are literally on the lookout for the negative, which makes evolutionary sense. Because if, if you feel like you don't have support, like nobody's coming to help you in an ancestral, our ancestral environment, you would want to be scanning for threats. But that's not very conducive to happiness. You know, I'm pretty introverted myself, yet introversion is correlated with a reduction in marriage quality because you need to be talking, you need to be communicating about what's going on in your head, because as we just established, people can't read your thoughts and feelings very well. And if you're not telling them, they're either not gonna know, or they're gonna make mistaken assumptions very often. So it really becomes key, because especially, specifically in marriages, people think, oh, if I raise this issue, we're gonna fight, if we fight, we might get divorced. But the truth is, Yelling and screaming only leads to divorce in 40% of, of, of cases. Usually what leads to divorce is people not talking enough, people not communicating those issues because, we, like I said, marriage doesn't more often come from yelling and screaming. It comes from people leaving, leading parallel lives where they feel like they're not understood, they're not connected, and they go in separate directions. What was really fascinating to me that surprised me was that in a marriage or a long-term relationship, complaining is not a negative. Complaint is actually a positive because issues get raised. It becomes negative when it becomes criticism, when you personalize it. So to say, you, you know, you didn't take out the trash, that's not a problem. What is a problem is you didn't take out the trash because you're a horrible person. When we personalize it, but raising issues is essential. This is essential in any relationship because like we established, we're really bad at reading other people's minds. So people don't know what you don't say. We need to say these things, even if we're, we're not, maybe, maybe if we're socially awkward, maybe we're introverted. These things need to get said to keep a relationship healthy. It's a stellar reminder. Eric, your book is geniusly titled, Plays Well With Others, right? What every leader in the world wants their team members to be able to do. Most of them have the technical skills, the ability to perform their expertise. And at the end of the day, all teams, all organizations are only as strong. Their competitive edge is only as strong as the relationships inside of their organization. I also love this tagline, the surprising science behind why everything you know about relationships is mostly wrong. How are you different as a result <laughs> of researching and writing this book? What are you doing, saying, thinking, seeing differently? 
I mean, uh, a lot now, especially it was it was very ironic to be writing this during the pandemic. Uh, you know, I literally um, it was two weeks after I closed the deal for this book that California, where I live, experienced lockdown. So I'm writing about the importance of relationships and I'm and I'm not having very many fulfilling relationships because I can't see people. So it was really a, a, it was really enlightening for me to be reading all of this about loneliness, about distance, but specifically what I'm doing now is, like I said, Carnegie, Carnegie's work is really good for the beginning of relationships. Um, to take it further, we need to demonstrate and hopefully receive costly signals from people, more powerful signals that you care and that someone else cares. And those are time and vulnerability. Time's always scarce. So giving someone your time consistently, frequently, that's a powerful signal that you care, and if they reciprocate, it's a powerful signal that they care. And vulnerability, opening up, saying things that might not make you look so good, talking about your, your fears, your concerns. This tells someone that you trust them because you're saying something that potentially could be used against you. I have not always been great about time, and I've certainly have not been good about vulnerability. So trying to make sure that I see my friends, the people I care about, or at least talk to them more often, and opening up a little bit more less about the facts and more about how I feel, uh, this is powerful. And I've, I've already seen positive results. Eric, close us out. Uh, of all the research that you uncovered, either you validated your thoughts or you were surprisingly wrong, what's the most actionable piece of advice around building relationships that everybody could benefit from, whether they are you know, married or they're divorced or they're widowed or they're a leader or they're a uh, an individual contributor, perhaps they're an introvert or an extrovert. What's, is there something sort of ubiquitous that you said, if people just did this more or knew this, they would play well with others? To not make assumptions and to ask more questions. Asking, asking questions, you know, we, sometimes I think some people feel like that's like weakness, but asking questions is incredibly flattering to people if it's about them personally. And you're going to get accurate information. You're, you're basically going to get the answers to the test. You know, in our personal business relationships, again, back to that study, you know, with strangers, we only accurately thought, predicted their thoughts and feelings 20% of the time. And we only reached 35% with spouses. And with marriages, asking questions is really critical, not just the little things, but asking your spouse, what is your definition of love? What is your definition of marriage? What is your definition of a good wife or a good husband? Those are tough questions, but if you get those answers, you can see, oh, uh, my definition is so different. Is there some way we can honor both of our values? It's really powerful, rather than making assumptions, to ask people questions. And like I said, it's really generally not inconvenient. It's very flattering to ask somebody, no, 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 please uh, tell me more about yourself. People love to talk about themselves. So to not make these assumptions, to ask questions, I think this is a valuable thing in any relationship. Eric, that was gold. My wife and I play this game. Of course, that means I play a game to my wife. So after we go to dinner with a couple, which is frequently, I get in the car and I'll report how many questions either of the other couple ask me about myself. And often it's none. Like I'll just, <laughs> I'll, I'll sit there for two hours, I'll ask them, perhaps way too many questions. I tend to probably take it to the extreme, up to a bit, you know, an antagonistic uh, 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 interrogator. But there's mm -hmm. oftentimes when we'll go through dinner for two and a half hours and the other person or people won't have asked me a single question about myself. I think you're absolutely right. To show genuine interest and desire in someone else by asking them questions to dispel perhaps your your prejudice against them or things you thought were true. It helps to invalidate or perhaps validate your, the confirmations you have. What great advice. Eric Barker, I'm a raving fan of your books. That's why I featured you as the capstone mentor in Master Mentors. I have single-handedly built your reputation on my book. Not, of course, true, but I, I, I evangelize your insights. The book is excellent. Plays well with others. Now, we have a problem because you said Freud had two big ideas, right? Uh, uh, work and relationships, and you've written now about both of them. What's going to be next for you? Well, I'd like to announce my retirement. 
Um, no, I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to find another uh, great figure in psychology uh, exactly. to, uh, to model things after. Now I'm gonna have to. Uh, Freud, it's been great. Uh, it's not, it's not you. It's me. But uh, I'm gonna have to move on now. Eric Parker, thank you for your generosity today. Thanks for agreeing to be a master mentors in the first book. Everyone, pick up a copy. Every team leader, pick up a copy of Plays Well With Others. What a great book to read with your team as sort of a, a book club as well. Eric, thanks for coming back on the podcast. It was great to be here. And we'll see you back next week for another conversation on leadership.